Alrighty, hello everybody. Uh, welcome back. Tonight we're going to talk about wines of Germany. So outline for tonight, we're going to go over, of course, the usual, some fun facts. We're going to cover the regions and climates of Germany, the different varieties that are made there, uh, different denominations and laws, how to interpret labels, um, maybe some famous blends. Not so much famous blends for this lecture, but definitely winemaking styles and methods. So for some fun facts, a little introduction, Germany is actually considered one of the top producers in the world for fine white wines and botrytized wines. If you don't remember us talking about botrytized wines, that's the noble rot, the mold that grows in the berries, it helps concentrate the sugars and to help produce really beautiful white wines that have honeyed-like characteristics. That's botrytized wines. So another fun fact about Germany is German vineyards are at the northernmost extreme of where grapes can dependably ripen and the majority of German wines are actually dry with the exception of expensive late harvest dessert wines, um, beer and Auslis and Trocken beer and Auslis. Um, I think it's actually pronounced in German um, Aus, Auslese. Um, so I'm going to do my best to pronounce everything right tonight, but I apologize in advance. I just, I don't speak German yet. Um, so this is a lot of, this is very new to me. So I'll just do the best that I can. Um, the German word for vineyard is Weinberg, which translates to wine hill. And that's very accurate because most of the country's best vineyards are on very extremely steep slopes, some of them up to 70% incline. So with that being said, there's absolutely... No tractor use for a lot of these. It's way too dangerous to drive a tractor on a slope that steep, especially if you're trying to drive uh, perpendicular. You get a very high chance of rolling. So everything is done by hand at that point. Um, it's a lot of physical labor. So lots and lots and lots of labor. Okay, so there's a lots of different wine regions within Germany. A lot of them focus around a river of some sort. There are 13 different wine regions, but we're just going to focus on four tonight, and that's going to be Mosel, um, Rheingau, Falls, and Franken regions. So in order of highest or most famous to maybe lesser known, kind of. Uh, but definitely they're all professionals in their own things. So varieties that are grown and produced in Germany, but not necessarily native, uh, white wines, Riesling, absolutely is the big one. Now, it's native to um, Germany. It is what it's famous for. Uh, it's a very big deal. The best Riesling in the world is produced in Germany. Uh, Gewurztraminer is another one. Gewurztraminer can have a bad rap sometimes because it's a very floral wine sometimes. It's a very floral grape. It's just naturally what is occurring in the skins. And um, oftentimes... For a very long time, it was created as a sweet wine, but there are some very beautiful dry white wines made from Gerwitztraminer now. Um, then we have also Grau Burgunder, which is Pinot Gris. So uh, Grau would be gray, Burgunder, Burgundy grape, so gray, Burgundy, Pinot Gris. We have Mueller uh, Turgau, which um, we're going to talk about a little bit. Muscateller, which is yellow muscat. Um, Rieslaner or Rieslaner is a cross between Riesling and Sylvaner or Sylvaner, some people would say. Um, then we also have an interesting one, Weissburgunder, which is Pinot Blanc, so white Burgundy, Weissburgunder, and Spat Burgunder, which would be red Burgundy, is Pinot Noir. So um, I think Spat is red. If not, it might be black. Uh, but that's a, kind of a fun way to determine. Um, on German labels, you can easily be like, oh, Grau Burgunder, Weiss Burgunder, Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc. You could definitely impress your friends if you knew that. So it's an easy, easy one to remember. Okay, climate in Germany. Overall, Germany is definitely cool climate, big time. Uh, the grape growing regions mostly cover areas that are oceanic slash maritime climates. I have links to that if you're interested in learning more. Uh, however, it is appropriate to say that climate has changed very dramatically in the last two decades in Germany. Uh, we've had some record high temperatures um, and in the summer times it's really increased the mean temperatures across the nation. So grape growing has shifted drastically. 
And we're going to talk about ice wine in a couple of slides. And that's really important because it's harvested when it's frozen during the really cool, cold, cold months. And with climate change, there's less and less and less production of ice wine in Germany because it's just been too warm or it hasn't been getting cold enough to produce that, that delicacy. Um, so it's actually very sad. It's less and less producers every year. And it was already expensive, so it's going to be much more expensive and hard to obtain now. So just depends. Okay, so first region we're going to talk about is the Mosel, which is a region that surrounds the Mosel River, of course. Um, this is definitely one of the regions that has very, very extremely steep slopes. So about 60 degree climb, uh, steepest slopes for German vineyards and almost all the vineyards around the entire world. This, of course, makes the vineyards very dangerous to work in. Um, this is the region that you're going to find the absolute top-notch Rieslings, um, Mueller Turgau, and also Pinot Noir, or as we discovered, Spat Burgunder. So a little more on the information um, on Mosel on that link back there if you'd like. Okay, Mosel Riesling. Uh, Riesling, I know there's a lot of sweet ones out there. Again, there's a lot of people that'll say like, I don't like German wines because they're sweet and Rieslings taste like petrol. That is not the common for actual high standard, um, high quality German wines. High quality German wines are very dry. They have just like this intense acidity that's like very, very um, lean and citrus. Um, and just intense bursting with just fruit citrus flavors. So if you like, for example, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, I really do think sincerely that you'll like a legitimate dry German Riesling. So Riesling in particular, again, very bright acidity and clarity of fruit flavors. Citrus, apple, lime is very, very common for this wine. It's only really in the aged Rieslings that you see more of a petrol character. So it starts to smell kind of like petroleum or gasoline. Um, and this can actually be noted as a very high quality character, as kind of weird as it may sound. Um, but it's definitely a really good way to also pick out Riesling from a blend is if you get any petrol. Very, very characteristic of that wine. So this is definitely noted as Germany's best variety, Riesling across the board. No doubt about it. Um, it's known to have remarkable finesse, elegance, and aging potential for a wine. So part of what makes a wine ageable is high acidity or high alcohol or even high sugar content can be a really good way to preserve something. Um, so high acidity is definitely one of those attributes. I put um, Mueller Turgau in here as another wine just because I hadn't heard of it before. I thought it was really interesting. It turns out that Mueller Turgau is actually a cross between Riesling and Madeleine Royal. It's not normally spoken highly of as a wine. Um, it can be described as bland if it's overcropped, which is very, very common in some parts. It's typically used as a blending wine. It does have really similar attributes to Riesling, of course, being genetically related to Riesling. So we see peach, rose petal, lemon, lime, and then flint, which is um, which sounds like a very, very nice variety. Um, this variety in particular, though, is important. I want you guys to remember it because it had a very huge role in rebuilding German wine industry following World War II. Um, this was a wine that was used for a cheap, cheap sweet wine. It was very easy to grow. It did very well in Germany. Um, so that's kind of the history and where the place that it holds and the importance that it had. So not, not that we can't produce good wines from Mueller or Turgau now, but um, just that that's, that was the history and that's the judgment that's placed over it at the moment. Okay, next on our list is Rheingau. This follows alongside the Rhine River, again, another river following region. This has the longest history of quality winemaking in Germany. So if you're a big, um, big uh, history buff, this would be the place for you. Uh, it's known to be a very serene, aristocratic wine region with an endless blanket of rolling vineyards. It's also a hotbed for vineyard classifications. They're also known for their Riesling. It takes over 80% of the vineyard plantings. This region gets more sun than the Mosel region. So this is said to result with fuller body wines, greater ripeness on the palate, um, giving weighted designations like um, Spot Liesen, uh, Ost Liesen, Beer and Ost Liesen, and Trockenbeer and Ost Liesen. And these are all 
um, different uh, ripeness that we're going to talk about in a couple slides when we talk about designations. So Rheingau is just one of those regions that can provide um, more sugar in their grapes, essentially. Next on the list is um, Falls. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. If not, again, I apologize. Um, Falls is derived from the Latin word palatinus, which means palace. Um, it had to do with um, royals or, or nobles that, that ruled in the region at one time. And um, anyway, so that's where that derives from. It's one of the most exciting and so-called inventive regions of Germany. It, this is a region that's not on the river, so it's a little bit farther away um, from a water source. It's, but it's technically a region um, of the Rhine, but it just doesn't sound the river. The wines from this region are far less severe than others, and by that meaning, less of that really intense, like, striking acidity and maybe more just a little mellowed out. It's one of the more southerly regions uh, of Germany, so it gets more sunlight and also more ripeness in fruit. So for this region, we're looking at Riesling, again, surprise, surprise, but also Gewurztraminer, Weissburgunder, and Spatburgunder, so Pinot Gris and Pinot Noir. So Gewurztraminer is by far one of my favorite grapes. If you ever get to visit a vineyard that grows Gewurztraminer, it's so freaking beautiful. First of all, the berries are just this like beautiful rosy pink color so it's very very easy to identify not only that like you eat a grape off the vine and it's like candy it's it's just floral and it's so sweet and um so refreshing so those characteristics of course translate into the wine so a lot of primary flavors that we get in a good Schuminer are lychee rose grapefruit tangerine and ginger so um, it's just, I love it. It's awesome. So it's very aromatic and it's, you know, just a very prominent wine in Germany. Again, it's very obvious if it's in a blend, it's just so aromatic and so intensely itself that there's, there's nothing else like it. So very, very easy once you understand what it is to identify it. Okay. Next on our list is my favorite region, which is, um, Franken, which is also, um, called Fran Fran Franconia or Franconia um, wine region. Again, sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, it's, they are known to make the best Sylvaner in the world. And so I know some people pronounce that Sylvaner, but whatever you prefer. So this is a smaller W-shaped wine region east of the Rheingau region. The climate here can be very severe. Uh, frost damage and harvest yields fluctuate greatly every year. Something that's special about this region, though, is this shaped bottle that you see here in the upper right corner is called a Boxbüttel. It's a traditional bottle shape exclusive, so only coming from the Franken wine region. And they normally use it for um, Sylvaner and wines like that, but um, I think it's really special. I think it's really cool. So Sylvaner actually comes from Austria. I remember that correctly. I think that's where it actually genetically comes from. Um, it's known to be a very nice white wine. Primary flavor is a peach, passion fruit, orange blossom, thyme, and flint. So again, definitely more of like, this is again, like a stainless steel driven, um, acid driven wine. It's very, very good. It's going to be very good if you are a fan of Pinot Gris already. So again, more of kind of like the stone fruit and tropical-ish flavors and some freshness um, and some subtle herbal flavors. Again, this is another variety that becomes a high risk for becoming bland if it's overcropped in the vineyards. So if you have one bottle that's bland, don't let it ruin the whole variety for you. Uh, keep trying and hopefully you'll find a better version of that. Okay, so those are the top regions I really wanted to cover. Um, I know it, with this class, it's just kind of a very general overview. You're always welcome to do more research. Um, it's just the format of this class and how much time we have. So it's just what we can do. But um, it's how it works out. So next, we're going to move into some of the wine laws and classification systems. And you're really going to have to bear with me because they changed everything or everything is about to change. Um, as of January 2021, new laws were introduced for the hierarchy of German uh, wine quality for their laws, 
Uh, it's based off of geographic location. So this is a system that fits a lot better with what the European Union currently has. Um, the implementation is progressive, but it will be absolutely official starting with the 2026 vintage. So it'll be here before we know it. That's, that's what we always say. Um, so we at the very bottom of the pyramid, we have um, Deutscher Wein, Deutscher Wein, which is 100% um, German grapes. So I think I said that wrong because it's, it's Deutschland, Deutscher Wein. I forget. I'm sorry. You had to bear with me. Um, that's 100% German grapes. So it just came wine from Germany. Um, then we have land wine, which is under a protected geographical indication, BGI. So this is a superior German wine with 0.5% more alcohol and must come from one of 19 specified districts. Um, then we have a quality wine, which I'm assuming, um, which is also, it's under PDO, which is protected designation of origin. So very similar to the European Union in that respect. So these have to obey regional appellation laws, be tasted by a committee and receive an AP number. Um, this is actually really important, kind of a side note. Um, I have family out in Germany who produce wine, and talking to them during the pandemic, they were having a very, very hard time producing wine because they couldn't bring the panels together to have the wine certified before bottling because of COVID. Um, so there was actually a huge halt on wine production in certain parts of Germany for a while because of the pandemic. Um, of course, now they are up and running again but I thought that was really interesting because here in California of course we don't have to have it tasted by a committee we just bottle um, as long as everything else checks off the list for our standards here but um, I don't know just a little fun info for you okay at the very very top of the pyramid we we also have um, product product cats vine which is also under PDO uh, wine with very special attributes all of these wines are naturally produced without adding sugar. So for those, I would imagine that would be, um, as we're going to see, um, Trocken beer and Aus, Auslese, um, or Auslese, and the other high sugar um, ripeness in the wines. Okay, so German classification goes one step further. Um, because it is so cold in Germany and it is so hard to ripen grapes, um, there are different levels awarded to ripeness of grapes harvested and also words used to, to describe and to communicate with consumers the sweetness of the wine itself. So we have two sides of the coin, coin, ripeness in the grapes harvested and then sweetness in the actual wine. So we're going to start with ripeness in grapes harvested and if if we talked about the sliding scale of flavors, depending on how grapes ripen, this is very relevant to that. So depending on how ripe the grapes were when they were harvested, which is based off of this list here, you can determine the flavors that might be present in the wine. So the earlier, definitely more citrus, more green. The later that it's harvested, um, more like stone fruit or maybe even cooked fruit and honey-like characters. So that's kind of like the two extremes there, just for a quick example. Okay, so categories for ripeness in the grapes that are harvested. So we have cabinet, which is, this is just grapes picked during a normal harvest. This is very standard. Um, then we have a spat laissez, which is harvested later than cabinet. Aus laissez, which is select bunches of exceptionally warmer years. So ripen very nicely above average. Then we have uh, beer and auslese, which is select berries of noble rot bunches. So noble rot, again, it's that um, mold that comes in and ripens the grapes and produces those honey-like characters. So um, this is select berries, not bunches, off of those noble rot bunches. So um, definitely a lot of labor goes into this, and it takes a lot of work, and this, these wines are going to be very expensive, of course. Then at the top of that, pyramid or the top of that ladder of ripeness, we have Trocken beer and Auslese, which is sometimes just noted as TBA. This is the richest, rarest, most expensive German wines. Only raisins from noble rot bunches are used to produce this wine. So 
lots and lots and lots of residual sugar in these wines are very, very sweet um, and very expensive, of course. Then I put also on here ice wine, um, just to give you an idea, again, of sweetness, because these grapes are harvested when they're frozen. Water freezes before sugar does, so um, it just concentrates the sugar that much more. So just for reference. Okay, so that was ripeness of the grapes that are harvested. On the other side of this, we have the categories of sweetness in the resulting wine itself. So we have trocken, which is just bone dry. Um, then we have halbtrocken, which is just half dry. So half dry halbtrocken um, or fine herb, uh, which is half dry, less than 1.8% residual sugar. Then we have um, lieblich or mild, which is some sweetness up to 4.5% residual sugar. So these are all things that are used to help um, identify characteristics of the wine on the label. And this is actually very helpful because even in America, we don't, we don't put on our labels necessarily sweetness unless we deliberately label it as a dessert wine. Sometimes when you buy a white wine, sometimes they'll have a scale on the back letting you know if it's sweet or dry, um, even for sparkling sometimes that we buy here. But most of the time we don't know um, unless we know we had the wine before or we know the producer or um, someone told us. So I think it's very helpful to have these descriptors. Um, okay, so how to interpret labels. Here's an example label for us. So we have the producer here, Hans uh, Wersching, I believe, the producer. Then under it, it says 2007, that's the vintage, so that's the year that the grapes are harvested. Um, Sylvaner or Sylvaner is the variety, the type of grapes that were used. You can tell that it's in a, a box boodle, so it's from Franken region or Franconia. Uh, village Vineyard is something Kronzberg can't see from here because I have really bad eyesight. You can also confirm that it says Franck in here at the bottom of the bottle for the region. And then it says Cabinet Trocken. So Cabinet means that the grapes are harvested at the normal harvest levels. And then Trocken indicates that this is a dry white wine. It also has an AP number, so this is a certified quality wine. So very, very exciting there. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Here's another label example. Um, this is a Riesling. And so we can see that this is the producer here, uh, Selbach Oster. It's a 2006, so a vintage of 2006. It's when the grapes were harvested. Village Vineyard, um, Zeltinger Schlossberg is the village in the vineyard. Uh, region, we have Mosel and then within the Saar district of Mosel region. Variety is Riesling, of course. Cabinet refers to the ripeness, ripeness level. And then we also have an AP number for certified quality. It's very, very faint, but it's down here. It says AP, NR, and then a bunch of digits. So um, you can actually go on to a website and type in that number, and you can learn more about that wine. Uh, there is a site for that. And um, yeah. Oh, also in a lot of European countries, they use a comma instead of a decimal. So it says alcohol, 9,5%. That's just 9.5% volume. Something that they do a little bit different than us. Okay. And lastly, ice wine. Ice wine, don't let it fool you. I know it's a sweet wine, and everyone has something to say about sweet wines. I love sweet wines when they're done correctly. Um, typically, with German sweet wines, the acidity is still so freaking high that it balances out the sugar very nicely. These are expensive wines. Very rare to find. If you can try one, I would highly recommend it. Recommend drinking it very cold as well. Uh, they're typically sold in half-size wine bottles, so instead of 750 milliliters, it's 375. And of course, the grapes are harvested frozen and immediately pressed. So just like I said before, the water freezes before the sugar content does in the grapes. So when it's pressed, all those little hard ice rocks help press all of that sweet, super, super syrup out of those grapes. Then that juice is pumped into a tank. It's only fermented part of the way, and the wine is left super sweet. So it's a very low alcohol, very high sugar dessert wine. It's very expensive, it's highly prized, 
and of course the German wine. So ice wine is produced in Mosel, Rheingau, Pfalz, and Rhein-Hessen regions. Um, that we might have to look that up and update that to today, of course, since climate has been changing. Um, but definitely something to look out for. This is definitely a, a specialty of Germany. Um, not many other people do a style of wine like this. Normally, if they do, they fortify it as well. But these are low alcohol wines with high sugar. So something a little bit different. Okay. Well, that is everything I have for Germany. Um, thanks for sitting along. I know it's not an incredible amount of information, but hopefully you could kind of get an idea of the country and the wines and, you know, what they're known for and maybe pique your curiosity into learning more um, or not. And maybe you can understand why you don't like German wines or why you might like German wines. Okay, well, thank you for listening and I will see you guys next time.